Chapter 14, Fortune and National Economy, 1790 to 1860. Chapter Introduction. The progress of invention is really a threat to monarchy. Whenever I see a railroad, I look for a republic. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1866. This quote is a very important because what it focuses on is the innovations that are going to exist during this time frame. As a result of these innovations, it's going to go ahead and have a lot of political and economic implications. The new nation bounded into the 19th century university movement. New England Yankees, Pennsylvania farmers, Southern Yeoman, cotton lords, and enslaved workers all pushed west in search of land and opportunity, soon to be joined by vast numbers of immigrants from Europe who also made their way to the fast-growing cities. And not only were people in motion, newly invented machinery boomed the cultivation of crops and manufactured goods, while workers, free and enslaved alike, labored ever longer, harder, and faster. Better roads, faster steamboats, far-reaching canals, and riveting railroad lines all moved people, foodstuffs, raw materials, and manufactured goods from coast to coast, from Gulf to Great Lakes, from American shores to the wider world. The prodigious momentum of burgeoning American capitalism gave rise to an economy that was remarkably dynamic, market-driven, and continentally scaled, internationally consequential. So what you want to get from this paragraph is that you're getting a whole bunch of people, New Englanders, Pennsylvania farmers, and also immigrants are going to go ahead and move westward. Uh, as people are moving westward, we're also going to go ahead and a lot of we're also going to have a lot of innovations, and as well as um, booming crops and booming manufactured goods. 14.1, The Westward Movement The rise of Andrew Jackson, the first president from beyond the Appalachian Mountains, exemplified the relentless westward march of the American people. The West, with its raw frontier, began to acquire its mythical status as the most American part of America. As Ralph Aldo Emerson wrote in 1844, Europe stretches to Alhenes, America lies beyond. The Republic was young, and so were the people. As late as 1850, half of Americans were under the age of 30. They were all restless and energetic, seemingly always on the move and always westward. One tall tale of the frontier described chickens that voluntarily crossed their legs every spring, waiting to be tied to the annual move west. By, in 1840, the Democratic Center of the American Population Map had crossed Alleghenies. Al By the eve of the Civil War, it marched across the Ohio River. Uh, so we want to understand from these first two paragraphs is just typically that there was an excitement to move westward. Uh, this was under the president of Andrew Jackson. Uh, so remember one of the things that he was responsible for in the previous chapter was the Indian Removal Act. Uh, so as a result of that, that cleared a lot of land. But more importantly, what's going on is it's going ahead and motivating people to uh, look for the riches in the West. Map 14.1, Western Movement of Center of the Population, 1790 to 2010. The triangles indicate the points at which the map of the United States waited for the population of the country in a given year would balance. Note the remarkable equilibrium of north-south pole from the 1790 to about 1940, and the strong spurt west and southwest thereafter. The 1980 census revealed that the nation's center of population had at least moved west of the Mississippi. The map also shows the slowing the westward movement between 1890 to 1940. The period of the, hemis immigra the heaviest immigration from Europe, which ended up in the East Coast cities. So this map is very important because what it focuses on is just the westward movement. Uh, and more importantly, what it also looks at is the population of the country in a given year would balance. So where is the centralized population at? So right around 1840, the time period that we're looking at, uh, it's right around West Virginia. Um, but as time goes on, of course... Uh, the population is going to shift more westward, right? Finally making it west past the Mississippi River, uh, not until the 1980, right? So we're getting a lot of western movement, but as it says, uh, the, the movement kind of subsides and stops um, as time goes on. Legend portrays an army of muscular axemen triumphantly carving civilization out of the western woods. But in reality, life was downright grim for most pioneer families. Poorly fed, ill-clad, housed in hastily erected shanties. Abraham Lincoln's family lived for a year in a three-sided lean-to made of, of brush and sticks. They were perpetual victims of disease, depression, and premature death. Above all, the bearable loneliness haunted them, especially the women who were often cut off from human contact, even their neighbors for days or even weeks. 
while confined to be cramped orbit of a dark cabin in the secluded clearing. Breakdowns and even madness were all too frequently the opportunities that the frontier uh, offered a pioneer woman. So with this paragraph, you just basically want to understand that the conditions that people had to deal with when moving west, um, it wasn't like the the myths that they had of army men triumphantly carving civilization. Uh, often life was filled with depression, disease, uh, and death. Uh, they use Abraham Lincoln as a perfect example of that in his small cramped conditions. Frontier life could be tough and crude for men as well. No holds barred, no holds barred wrestling, which permitted such uh, niceties as the biting off of noses and the gouging out of eyes was a popular entertainment. Pioneering Americans marooned by, by geography were often ill-informed, superstitious, provincial, and fiercely individualist, individualistic. Ralph Waldo Emerson's popular lecture essay, Self-Reliance, struck a deeply responsive chord. Popular literature of the period abounded with portraits of unique, isolated figures like James Fenimore Cooper's heroic Natty Bumpu and Herman Melville's restless Captain Ahab, just as Jacksonian politics aimed to emancipate the lone wolf, enterprising business person. Yet even in this heyday of rugged, rugged individualism, there were important exceptions. Pioneering men facing tasks clearly beyond their own individual resources. They relied upon the labor of their womenfolk, children, and neighbors in the booming cotton south, their slaves, for log rolling and barn raising. Community was crucial to survival, as were governments, local as well as federal, for helping in building internal improvements like canals and roads. Uh, so what you want to understand about here is that uh, life moving westward is also tough for the men. Uh, they discussed this idea called self-reliance, uh, which kind of focused on that the individual uh, was focused more on themselves, but not necessarily just focused on themselves, but more they w were looking at themselves to be responsible for their own survival during this time of moving westward. But obviously, as you read on that passage, uh, it shows that was more of a myth that men relied so much more on their family, uh, their community, uh, as well as their government, looking at slaves as well to provide them the assistance that they needed to survive. So uh, if we go back to our guided questions here, uh, we should have definitely answered everything here. Uh, we, had, we went ahead and we described the family life, right? There were many problems, depression, disease, so forth. You go back in that section, take a look at that. Uh, what was the subject of the essay of self-reliance? Uh, well, self-reliance kind of just focused on this idea that one is uh, focused more and reliant on themselves to be able to survive. Uh, the community is not so much needed. What was defined? What, what do we mean by rugged individualism? Rugged individualism. What we mean by that is specifically that the males were able to kind of survive on their own, uh, using their own strengths. Um, but as we could see, that no, all these things were just myths, and it was essential that people used the uh, their community and their family to survive through these terrible conditions. Fourteen point two: shaping the Western landscape. The Western movement also molded physical environment. Pioneers in a hurry often exhausted the lands and tobacco rains or regions and then pushed on, leaving behind barren and rain gutted fields. In the Kentucky homelands, cane as high as 15 feet posed a seemingly insurmountable burial to the plow. But settlers soon discovered that when the cane was burned off, European bluegrass thrived in the charred cane fields. Kentucky bluegrass, as it was somewhat inaccurately called, made ideal pasture for livestock, and lured thousands of American homesteaders in Kentucky. The American West felt the pressure of civilization in additional ways. By the 1820s, American fur trappers were setting their trap lines all over the Rocky Mountain region. The fur trapping empire was based on the rendezvous, French for meeting, French for meeting system. Each summer, traders ventured from St. Louis to uh, verdant Rocky Mountain Valley, made camp and waited for trappers and Indians to arrive uh, with beaver belt, pelts to swap for manufactured goods from the east. The trade thrived for some two decades. By the time the beaver hats had gone out of fashion, the hapless beaver had all but disappeared from the region. Train the buffalo robes also flourished, leading eventually to virtually total annihilation of massive bison herds that once blanketed the western prairies. So far the west on the California coast, other traders brought up prodigious quantities of sea otter pelts, driving the once bountiful otters to the point of near extinction. Some historians have called the aggressive and often heedless exploitation of the West natural bounty, e ecological imperialism. 
So what you want to understand about this paragraph is uh, these last two is that as people moved west, this was very um, hazardous towards the environment. Of course, you need the bison that are killed in Colorado uh, and as well as the beavers that are also uh, being taken out of western Rocky Mountain region specifically for trade. So that's what we mean by e ecological imperialism. Yet Americans this period also revere nature and admire its beauty. In the spirit of nationalism, but a growing belief in the uniqueness of American wilderness. Searching for the United States' distinctive characteristics in this nation-conscious age, many observers found the wild, unspoiled character of the land, especially in the West, to be among young nations' binding attributes. Other countries might have impressive mountains or sparkling rivers, but none had the pristine, natural beauty of America, unspoiled by human hands, and reminiscent of a time before the dawn of civilization. This attitude towards wilderness became, in time, a kind of natural or national mystique, inspiring literature and painting, and eventually kindling a powerful conservation movement. So what you understand here is people move westward, they admired the beauty of America, looking at the mountains and the rivers. Major Do Doherty's Indian Agency on the Mississippi River by Carl Bodmer, 1833. The Swiss-born and Paris-trained artist Carl Bodmer painted this scene while accompanying German Prince Maximilian on his expedition across the American West. From St. Louis, the party traveled up the Mississippi River by steamboat under the protection of Jacob of John Jacob Astor's fur company. Bodmer painted scenes along the way, especially of Indians and their surroundings. Training posts like this one both promoted commerce with Indians and settlers heading west. Uh, so obviously here we're starting to see a lot of art, and with this art, uh, they're promoting westward movement uh, because of the economic prosperity that's there. George Catlin, a painter and a student of Native American life, was among the first Americans to advocate the preservation of nature as a deliberate national policy. In 1832, he observed the Sioux Indians in South Dakota, recklessly slaughtering buffalo in order to trade uh, the animal's tongues for the white man's whiskey. Appalled at the spectacle and fearing for the preservation of Indians and buffalo alike, Catlin proposed the creation of a national park. His idea later bore fruit with the creation of a national park system. The world's uh, first, beginning at, with Yellowstone Park in 1872. Um, so one of the things that we want to understand is Catlin is so important because you can kind of consider him as the father of the National Park, right? Looking at his paintings, uh, he depicted a lot of life, but one of the things that he was also concerned about is the preservation of life. So George Catlin, you want to understand of him, is the father of National Park. So by this time, we should have went ahead and answered uh, questions five through eight. Uh, the most important one here would probably be this idea of ecological imperialism. Ooh. The March of Millions. As American people moved west, they also multiplied at an amazing rate. By mid-century, the population was still doubling approximately every 25 years, as in fertile colonial days. See figure 14.1. All in all, I mean, what you could see here is generally around this time frame we're looking at, uh, America is rapidly growing in population. By 1860, the original 13 states had more than doubled in number. 33 stars graced the American flag. The United States was the fourth most populous nation in the Western world, it exceeded only by three European countries, Russia, France, and Austria. Urban growth continued explosively in 1790, and there had only been two American cities that could boast populations of 20,000 or, or more souls, Philadelphia and New York. By 1860, there were 43. By about three, but and about 300 other places claimed over 5,000 inhabitants apiece. New York was a metropolis. Paul, uh, was metropolis. New Orleans was the queen of the South, and Chicago, the swaggering lord of the Midwest, destined to be the hog butcher of the world. Uh, what this paragraph is basically talking about, we're starting to get the rise of cities. Uh, such overpaid, such over rapid urbanization, unfortunately, brought undesirable byproducts. It, it intensified the problems of smelly slums, feeble streetlight, inadequate policing, impure water, foul sewage, ravenous rats, and improper garbage disposal. Hogs poked their scavenging snouts about many city streets as late as the 1840s. Boston in 28 pioneered a sewer system. In 1842, New York abandoned wells and cisterns for a piped-in water supply. The city thus unknowingly eliminated the breeding places of many disease-carrying mosquitoes. Continuing birth rate accounted for the most of the increase in population. But by the 1840s, the tides of immigration were adding hundreds of thousands of more. Before this decade, immigrants had been uh, flowing in at a rate of 60,000 60, a year. 
but suddenly the influx tripled in the 1840s and then quadrupled in the 1450s. During these feverish decades, over a million and a half Irish and nearly as many Germans swarmed down the gangplanks. See table 14.1. Why did they come? Uh, so a couple of things that we want to understand in this paragraph that I'm, po um, that I'm pointing right here. I mean, I, one of the things I discussed was you're starting to get a lot of cities formed, such as Chicago, New Orleans, uh, Philadelphia, New York are becoming more developed. But with that overpopulation also comes a lot of problems. You're getting disease that's spreading more, more easily, impure water. You're getting rats. Uh, I mean, just these places are turning into slumps, right? Uh, one of the reasons why a lot of the population was also increasing was not just because of reproduction, but because you're also getting a very high Irish German population, which you could see right here. So if you go back to that section, um, one of the things that we sh march in millions, uh, there were numerous problems that exist in the cities. Make sure that you mention that for that question number nine, such as the smelly slums, the disease, rats, and so forth. Uh, what two groups immigrated from the U.S. or to the U.S. in 1840s? Uh, we're going to look at the Germans and the Irish. We'll discuss why and what did uh, American letters em emphasize. So we're going to go ahead and discuss that right now. The immigrants came partly because Europe seemed to be running out of room. The population of the old world more than doubled in the 19th century, and Europe began to regenerate a, a seeding pool of apparently surplus people. They were displaced and footloose in their homelands because they felt that the tug of American magnet. Indeed, at least as many people moved about within Europe as crossed over the Atlantic. America benefited from these, pe benefited from these people, churning changes, but did, not, uh, but did not set them all in motion. Nor was the United States the sole beneficiary of the process. Of the nearly 60 million people who abandoned Europe in the century after 1840, about 25 million went somewhere other than the United States. Uh, so one of the reasons why that we're getting people that are coming from Germany and Ireland uh, and just Europe in general is specifically because of the overcrowdedness that's going on in Europe. But we must understand that it's just not America where they're going to. They're also going to other places uh, throughout the world. Yet America still beckoned, the most strongly, uh, back, still beckoned most strongly to the struggling masses of Europe, and the majority of the migrants headed for the land of freedom and opportunity. There was freedom from Aristotle, from Aristotle caste and state church. There was abundant opportunity to secure broad acres and better one's condition. Much read letters sent home by immigrants, America letters, often described in glowing terms the richer life, low taxes, no compulsory military service and three meat meals a day. The introduction of the trans and, trans and oceanic steamships also meant that immigrants could come speedily and cheaply. The journey to the United States now took 10 or 12 days instead of 10 or 12 weeks on a sailing vessel. And it was much less expensive than a voyage to a more distant immigrant destination such as Australia, Argentina, or South Africa. The United States also received a far more diverse array of immigrants than did other countries. Argentina, for example, had a higher proportion of immigrants relative to a population in the United States, but they came mostly from Spain and Italy. In contrast, the United States beckoned immigrants from dozens of different nations. So if we look back at our questions here, um, I mean, we talked about these idea of uh, American letters, and these are letters that are coming from the immigrants, sending it back home, just talking about how great life is. Right. Um, but if we go back to this section uh, over here, um, then the reason why they think life is so great, specifically because, number one, three meat meals a day. Uh, that's, from the eyes of these immigrants, significantly better than perhaps the diet that was filled more with grain and uh, wheat. Uh, another thing is uh, lower taxes and you no know, forced military service at this time. Right. So there was a lot more freedoms that existed. 14.4, the Emerald Isle moves west. Ireland, already groaning under the heavy, under the heavy hand of British overlords, was prostrated in the mid-1840s. A terrible rot attacked the potato crop, on which the people had become dangerously dependent, and about one-fourth of them were swept away by disease and hunger. Star bodies were found dead by the roadsides with grass in their mouths, 
All told, about 2 million perished. So you understand here is the main reason why the Irish are coming was because of the potato famine. With this potato famine, it's leading to millions of people dying. Uh, the United States uh, would be a place where many of the Irish people would want to kind of escape the poverty and the disease during this time. Tens of thousands of destitute souls fleeing the land of famine uh, for the land of plenty flocked to America in the Black 40s. Ireland's great export has been population. And the Irish take their place beside the Jew and the Africans as, as dispersed people. If Ireland's green field scarcely equipped her sons and daughters for the scrap and scramble of American life in American cities, life in the old country nevertheless had instilled with them an aptitude of politics. Irish Catholic resistance against centuries of English Anglican domination instructed old century Irish in the ways of mass politics. That political experience, readied from the boss system, the political machines in North uh, America's northeastern cities, the boss's local representatives met each newcomer soon after he landed in America, asking on for votes. The machine supplied coal in wintertime, food and help with law. Irish voters soon became a bulwark of the Democratic Party, reliably supporting the party of Jefferson and Jackson in cities like New York and Boston. As Irish Americans like New York's honest John Kelly um, John John Kelly themselves became bosses. White collar jobs and government service opened up to the Irish. They became building specs, inspectors, aldermen, and even policemen. An astonishing irony for people driven from their whole land by nightsticks and bayonets of the British police. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at here is, of course, uh, during this time, I mean, you're also getting conflict between the Irish as well as the English Anglican Church. Uh, this goes back to European conflict, right? That's something that existed. But I think the most thing you want, the most important thing that you want to understand is that um, when the Irish came over here and they immigrated, uh, one of the things that they talked about here was the political experience writing them for the boss system of the political machines in Americans' northeastern cities. I want you to think about this. This is very similar to what we call the spoil system, right? When one of the things that would happen is Irish people would vote for, for certain representatives, and as a result of for them voting for these representatives, they were given jobs. They became building inspectors, aldermen, and even policemen, right? So you could see here the spoil system at work. Uh, that's how the machine worked in these North American cities. Uh, you support a candidate, and in re in return for that uh, for that uh, the support, they're going to go ahead and give you that job, right? I'll continue on. These uprooted newcomers, too poor to move west and buy necessary land, livestock, and equipment, swamped into the larger seaboard cities. Noteworthy were Boston and particularly the New and New York, which rapidly became the largest Irish city in the world. Before many decades had passed, more people of Iberian blood lived in America than on the old sod of Aaron's Ale. So what this is saying is that a significantly amount, high amount of Irish immigrants were coming in. Uh, and that's what they make reference to before the many decades had passed, uh, that there's more people living in Ireland and America than some of the cities um, in Ireland, right? Uh, one thing you understand here is what they talk about is, I mean, they're moving to these big cities such as Boston, New York. Uh, I mean, this is evident. I mean, for example, you look at uh, even sports teams today, such as the Boston Celtics, right? Uh, the term Celtic, of course, represents the mass amount of the Irish population that lived in America during this time. The luckless Irish immigrants received no red carpet treatment. Forced to live in squalor, they were rudely cramped up in the already vile slums. They were scorned by the older American stock, especially uh, proper Protestant Bostonians who regarded the scruffy Catholic rivals as a social menace. Barely literate biddies, Bridget's took jobs as kitchen maids, broad-shouldered patties, Patrick's were pushed into pick-and-shovel drudgery on canals and railroads, where thousands left their bones as victims of disease and accidental explosions. It also said that an Irishman lay buried under every railroad tie. As wage-depressing competitors for jobs, the Irish were hated by Native workers. No Irish need apply. Was a, was a sign commonly posted at factory gates, as was often abbreviated to Nina. The Irish, for similar reasons, uh, fiercely resented the blacks, with whom they shared society's basement. Race riots between the black and Irish stock was flared up in several port cities, and the Irish were generally cool to the abolitionist cause. So one thing you understand here is that the Irish were not accepted immigrants. Uh, people were not happy with them because they felt like they were taking their jobs. Um, another thing that you want to understand here, I mean, actually, let me take it back. That's why we have this acronym for NINA. No Irish need apply, right? 
Um, and of course, we're also getting the religious conflict. Remember, America this during this time has a high Protestant population, and now you are getting the Catholic Irish that's moving in. Know the difference between Protestant and Catholic. The, friend, the, the friendless famine Irish were forced to fend for themselves. The ancient order of Iber Hibernians, a uh, semi-secret society found in Ireland uh, to fight rape, or rape, well, rapacious landlords, served in America as benevolent society, aiding the, the downtrodden. Uh, it also helped to spawn the Molly Maguires, a shadow Irish miners union that locked that rocked the Pennsylvania coal districts in the 1860s and 1870s. I butchered that paragraph. Sorry, guys. It's late at night. Um, but of course, what we're seeing here, there are organizations that are in place to kind of provide assistance to the Irish. The Irish tended to remain in low skill op occupations, but gradually improved their lot, usually by acquiring modest amounts of property. The education of children was cut short as families struggled to save money to purchase a home. But for humble Irish peasants, who he cast out of their homeland, property ownership counted as a grant of success. Politics quickly attracted these gregarious Gaelic newcomers, meaning the Irishmen. They soon began to gain control of powerful machines, and notably, New York's Tammany Hall uh, reaped the patronage rewards. Before long, believably, Rogue Irishmen dominated police department in many big cities, where they now proved the paddy wagons that had once carted their brawling forebears to jail. So what they're talking about here is, of course, um, that the Irishmen would go ahead and assimilate into American politics. Tammany Hall is a political machine. I mean, Tammany Hall, when you look at this political machine, when you're getting the same politicians that are in power, but and of course, uh, they're surrounding themselves with the spoil system, hiring people that support them. Okay. Uh, American politicians made haste to, the cult to, to cultivate the Irish vote, especially in politically potent state of New York. The Irish hatred of the British lost nothing in the transatlantic transplanting. As the Irish Americans increased in number, nearly 2 million arrived between 1830 and 1860. Officials in Washington glimpsed at political gold in those emerald green hills. Politicians often found it politically profitable to fire uh, verbal volleys at London process vulgarly known as twisting the British lion's tail. So what they're talking about here is that a lot of politicians want to get the Irish vote. And one of the ways that they do that is they uh, highly criticize the British. Uh, so one of the things that we're looking at here, um, these are all things that you should have gotten talking about the Irish population. Uh, where did the bridges and the paddies work? You want to go for it, look for it specifically. I mean, obviously they were not working in great conditions. Uh, what did Nina stand for? We went ahead and discussed that. What was Tammany Hall? I uh, go back. I talked a little bit about the political machine uh, where you're getting the Irish support for these politicians. Uh, and these politicians are kind of just um, maintaining power, but they're also utilizing the spoil system. Uh, how did the Roman Catholicism both help and hinder the Irish in America in the early 19th century? Uh, when you're going through this, one of the things you understand, I'd say go back, but you should see that the, although it's causing conflict with some of the Protestants that are there, uh, one thing you understand, it also provided a good support system. German 48ers. The influx of refugees from Germany between 1830 and 1860 was hardly spectacular than that from Ireland. During these troubled years, over a million and a half Germans stepped into American soil. In America, they formed enduring religious communities, isolated enclaves where they could shield themselves from the corruption and the conveniences of the modern world. To this day, the German-speaking Amish still travel in horse-drawn carriages in the farm without heavy machinery. No electric lights brighten the darkness that nightly env um, envelops their tidy farmhouses. No ringing telephones punctuate the reverent tranquility of their mealtime prayer. No ornaments uh, rel relive the austere simplicity of their black garments. The Amish men remain a stalwart traditional community in a ruthless, turbulent society, living testament to the religious ferment of social experiments of the antebellum era. So what they're talking about here, of course, is the German Amish people and how they still kind of live a life of isolation and not necessarily use the technology uh, that society now has today. Right. And you could see that right here in this image. The bulk of them, the Germans, were uprooted farmers, displaced by crop failures and other hardships. But a strong sprinkling were liberal and political refugees, saddened by the collapse of the democratic revolutions of the 1848. They had decided to leave the autocratic fatherland to flee America, the brightest hope of democracy. So they're just talking about here, there's political hardship. That's the reason why they're coming to America, as well as economic failure. 
Germany's loss was America's gain. Zealous German liberals uh, like the Lankian public, spirited Karl Schurz, a relentless foe of slavery and public corruption, contributed richly to the elevation of American political life. Unlike the Irish, many of the German newcomers possessed a modest amount of material goods. Most of them pushed out of the lush lands in the Middle West, notably Wisconsin, where they settled and established model farms. Like the Irish, they formed an influential body of, vo of voters whom American politicians shamelessly wooed. But the Germans were less potent politically because their strength was more widely scattered. So one of the things that they're talking about comparing to the Irish, Irish were all in big cities. Uh, they're typically centralized. So with that in mind, they had a lot of political influence. Right? People would go to these areas specifically to woo them to get their vote. Um, with the Germans, they're a little bit all over the place. Uh, in fact, one of the things that they said, that there is notably Wisconsin, which is completely true. Even now, uh, there are... They have a German fest, not a October fest, but they have a German fest in July in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, there's also a suburb called Germantown, Wisconsin, which is not too far from Milwaukee. The hand of Germans in shaping American life was widely felt in still other ways. The Conestoga wagon from Kentucky Rifle and the Christmas tree were all German contribu contributions to the American culture. Germans had fled from the militarism, the wars in Europe, and consequently came to a bulwark of isolationist sentiment in the upper Mississippi Valley. Better educated on the whole than the stump-grubbing Americans, uh, they warmly supported public schools, including the kindergarten, children's garden. Uh, they likewise did much to stimulate art and music. Uh, outspoken, as outspoken champions of freedom, they became relentless enemies of slavery during the uh, fevered war years of the Civil War. So one thing this paragraph is talking about is just the traditions that they brought in. Of course, the Christmas tree, uh, public education for the younger generation. I mean, that's what kindergarten, kindergarten is a German term meaning children's garden. Um, and of course, they were also a lot more liberal, more supporters of democracy. Uh, they were completely against slavery. Yet the Germans often dubbed damn Dutchmen were occasionally regarded with suspicion by their old stock American farmers or neighbors, seeking to preserve the language and culture. They sometimes settled in compact colonies and kept aloof from the surrounding community. Accustomed to the continent of Sunday and curbed by the Puritan tradition, they made merry on the Sabbath and drank huge quantities of amber beverage called beer, which dates its real popularity in America to their coming. Their old drinking habits, like those of the Irish, spurred advocates of temperance and the use of alcohol to redouble the reform efforts. Uh, so one of the things that you want to understand here is that there was that German discrimination that took place. Um, I mean, they would bring in beer later on. We'll talk about when we discuss the temperance movement. The Irish and both the German would kind of be stereotyped as drunks, uh, which kind of just shows that nativism. Nativism means pride in America. And in some ways, it also means putting down those that were immigrants during this time. So if we go back to our questions, we can discuss why they came to the U.S., right? We're looking at, pol and I'll elaborate on this, this idea of um, political freedom, but as well as failed crops. Uh, what American institution did Germans oppose? What schooling did Germans start? Uh, I mean, of course, they opposed slavery. Uh, remember, they were uh, very liberal and fighters for democracy. And, of course, they started kindergarten, right? I mean, that's what kindergarten meaning... Uh, we said, I believe it was garden school or children's garden. Um, what three things the Germans contribute to America? I'll let you go back. Uh, but of course, a Christmas tree is one of them, right? All right. Uh, next section, uh, which we're going to talk about is flares up of anti-foreigners. And this will be continued in the next video.